He's going to be late. Call the uh, September 21st school committee meeting to order. Uh, tonight uh, we have the uh, our main item on the agenda is the Walker uh, review of the Walker report. And uh, <coughs> following that, we have some uh, donations and, and such to go over uh, in our reports at the end. I did want to uh, just briefly say that uh, I know that there's been some questions about uh, uh, when are we going to do the superintendent's evaluation. That there's there's no uh, there's no no real reason uh, why. Well, there is a reason why we haven't done it yet, and that's just the, the scheduling issue. There's no uh, issues with it or concerns with it or or anyone any cause for concern for anybody. And uh, so that we are uh, working to uh, get get it on the schedule for next week, uh, and uh, it's not formal yet, but I believe we're going to meet on Tuesday night uh, instead of Wednesday night to go over that. Monday night instead of Monday night. I mean instead of Monday night. Yeah. Uh, so just just to allay anybody's fears, there's no issues or problems with it. It's just been a schedule. So, so with that. Uh, The Walker Report. Great. All right, I'm going to come stand over here. Try to keep you guys engaged with a lot of information. So, as you're all aware, we had Walker Partnerships come out and do a program evaluation of our special education programs during last school year. They came out between February and May of last year. And I'm going to go through the beginning slides kind of quickly because everyone's seen the report and I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on some of the early on pieces. I'm going to talk about the introduction and the purpose, the methodology, the commendations, findings and recommendations, and next steps. And I've kind of chunked those pieces together to give you a sense of what were the findings and recommendations and then what are the next steps that we want to move forward with. So, um, Dr. Dory and I had met with Walker, I think it was in January or February of last year, and we really felt that this was a great opportunity for us to do a program evaluation with me being new to the position and wanting some additional information on what direction and what were some of the priorities. We also had some questions about paraprofessional staffing and wanted to see how we compared in terms of our paraprofessionals. So um, Walker, we engaged Walker in the conversation and they began kind of taking a look at our program. So we wanted to get, this gives you some of the pieces that we wanted to look at. We wanted to look at expenditures, we wanted to look at our practices, we wanted to look at staffing, our programs. We kind of really wanted a comprehensive look. So in order to do that, we provided Walker with a lot of data um, and a lot of paperwork. They reviewed student records, and they had the opportunity to interview staff, and they also had the opportunity to interview parents. The parents that participated were those parents who had come to CPAC meetings previously and shared their email addresses. So those were the parents who were contacted and given the opportunity to come in. I think we had eight parents participate in that, um, which is on average probably what we get at a CPAC meeting, it's about eight families. Um, so, they looked at documentation. They also did walkthroughs, so each of the principals had the opportunity to meet. There were two gentlemen from Walker who came out. They had a chance to go to every building and walk through the schools with the principals and see the different spaces, to see classrooms. They also spent time observing our programs. So they sat in our programs and observed what was happening. And then you'll see the list of people that they had the chance to interview and the reason why it kind of took so long was one we had a lot of snow <laughs> uh, so there was a lot of scheduling pieces and then as we went through the process we realized that we wanted to make sure we included all stakeholders and when we had finished the first round of interviews we realized that we didn't have any classroom teachers and we had to reach out to our parent community so we made the decision to delay the findings on the report until we had a chance to have some classroom teachers and some parents participate in interviews, just so we had all stakeholders as part of this process. 
Um, so I think you all had a chance to see the questions that were asked of our staff, and then there were questions asked of parents. So they asked the same questions with all staff, and they asked the same questions. The parents met as a, as a group. They actually met down here. Um, so these were the questions that were asked of them. Um, so some of the commendations, I mean, I think uh, you all had a chance again to review these. It was, you know, commending Dr. Doherty and myself for commissioning this, um, that our staff were very open and honest in the interview process, which I, I do think the staff um, were really invested in getting some good feedback from the process and shared a lot of information. Um, in their observations, they saw very dedicated staff, which we know that we have here, especially in our special education programs. Um, that our staff were committed to student success. They noted that um, at Coolidge in particular, there were monthly meetings being held for paraprofessionals to really keep them connected to what was going on. Uh, they noted the work that we were doing in our vertical meetings that last year with our special education staff, so it was an opportunity for both Learning Center and program teachers to meet vertically, and that was something that staff reported that they really liked doing. Um, the, the PLC work. Um, last year we had Alan Bloom from, he's retired from Simmons College, come out and do some work with our special education staff on IEP writing, and that's something they noted that was a very positive experience for staff. Um, our building principals are very supportive of our programs and are very invested in the success of those programs. Um, we have a lot of technology for students. Um, we have a wide range of programs. We've talked about those before to meet different types of learning needs. Um, the, the work that we do with occupational therapy, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, but that they have a very integrated and proactive approach from preschool and through kindergarten. And then the co-taught work that we do is something else that they thought was a commendation. They noted in our records we have well-written IEPs. We make sure students have access to the general education curriculum. We have lots of instructional supplies and materials. We um, contract for consultative services, so through STEAM and other contracted service providers when students have unique needs, like they may need a teacher that's visually impaired, we contract for those services to make sure students have them. Um, we try to make sure we have a continuum of programs, and then they noted, um, the higher percentage that we have of students who are included in the general education setting than the statewide average. Um, more commendation, the work that we've done with STEAM around our transportation contract, um, <coughs> the ongoing efforts that we make to have students return to the district from out of district placements because of the strength of our in-district programs. Um, as we talked about last year, we did a great job on our coordinated program review by the Department of Education. Um, the TSP program, there's a typo there, but the TSP program at the high school, last year we used some grant funds to help that program develop a system for data collection on students. And so that was something that they noted was actually happening, which is always great when you use grant funds to train people and then you see someone from the outside commend the work that's happening. And then the work that is happening at the Rise Preschool, that we have a continuum um, of options for students. We have substantially separate to fully integrated options for our early childhood needs. So I'm going to, again, kind of go through the data pretty quickly because I think you've had a chance to look at this. But this is a comparison of um, our special education census to like districts. So our percentage of students on IEPs, this is just IEPs and laden. And then again, this is looking at the percentage of students by disability category. So you'll see the highlighted pieces for Reading is that our communication number is lower than the state average and our specific learning disabilities number is higher. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in the findings piece. Um, again, these are comparison by like districts. Um, these are our inclusion numbers. So 68.2% of our students are in full inclusion, 20.7 partial, and 86.2 is, is the total number of inclusion. 
So, and then you see the state average. So you see we're well above the state average for including students. And then this is about substantially separate. So this is the percentage of our students who are substantially separate. Carol, just yes. a quick question. So how do we come up with this? I, I know how we do it in other, other measurements in terms of like districts, but mm -hmm. it's funny, I've never seen Easton as, as someone. I don't know how. Yeah, Walker well, came up with these comparable they districts. Did. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't. We did not. We did not give those. No, they came up with the comparable, so. Um. Did they give you, I'm sorry. Yes? Okay. Did they give you an indication as to how they chose them, or are they just? No, no, they did not. They did not provide that information. That would be something I think I'd want to know. Mm -hmm. How did they pick the comparable yeah. districts? Um, and then this um, is funding for special education. So our total writing school budget and then the special education budget. So you can see the change over time in terms of the total school budget and the special ed budget. And then this one, oops, the funding for special education. Again, you see the funding comparisons to the like district. Again, I think we're kind of right in the mix with these comparable districts, but I don't know exactly the reason they picked those. And then this gives you the percentage of the total budget and the percentage of students on IEPs. So just kind of a quick snapshot, and then you see the state average. So again, I don't think we're too off of anything that's happening statewide. Um, and then this shows you our out-of-district placement. So where do we have students? So 4.7% are in public day, 2.4% at private day, and 3.3% in residential placement. Um, and then this was the look at the paraprofessional piece, which um, we still need to do some of our own analysis on because when we look at those numbers we don't think they're um, the actual numbers we think it has to do with our year-end reporting I think but we need to dig a little deeper Martha and I felt like there might be something off in that because we seem to have more than that number of paraprofessionals for special education so um, but this is saying 67.1 but it could be an FTE piece um, because sometimes we look at the total number of people versus FTEs. So we'd have to dig a little deeper into this number. So some of the key findings, I think this is really important to just take a look at this number because what you see here is the number of students on IEPs when you start at the elementary, you move to middle, and then when we get to high school. And then when we add in a 504 plan, a 504 plan is also for students who are identified with disabilities. So when we add in 504 plans, you'll see that we're at the high school, we're at 28% of our population, our students identified with disabilities. And we seem to be increasing the number of students requiring some sort of specialized instruction as they move through the grades. So this is just an important factor to be looking at. Yeah. Is there um, some reasoning behind why that occurs? Why we get to, you know, almost double the middle school and high school? Well, I think as we go through the process, you'll see there's a lot of recommendations around training on the eligibility process and ensuring that staff are going through and identifying, accurately identifying who has a disability. Um, I also think we look at what types of supports for general education are available. So as we move to high school, there aren't as many general education supports than elementary. We have reading specialists, we have Title I, we have other things that we offer to support students who are struggling, and as they move higher and higher, those general ed supports <coughs> become less and less. So it's sort of balancing and looking at how are students able to get the supports they need, and do they require special education? I had a, a sort of connected question. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any data on how these numbers relate to peer communities or state averages? So it looked like the number of students in special education was pretty comparable, comparable. but it was much lower than 24, 28% the 504s. So I'm just wondering, do we have any data on that? I don't have anything specifically, but that's a similar question that the Administrative Council asked, so it's something that I think we wanted to get more information to see if similar communities were seeing this rise. You know, we would, we would want to see a decrease, you know, that students are responding to the interventions, 
but it is something that we have to look you know, more deeply into and really look at those numbers a little more. So findings and recommendations. So the first area that Walker gave us some feedback on was our MTSS process. As you guys are all aware, we are using our school culture and transformation grant to work on implementing MTSS. And what they found is that we as a district have varying um, levels of implementation, which is not a surprise to us, but it does impact how things are being perceived. And at one point, the recommendations say, you know, we need to kind of make a decision. Well, we have made a decision that we are going with the MTSS process. So um, you'll see in the kind of next steps what we're doing around that. They also indicated we need to develop and distribute our DCAP. And we need to start having more conversations between general ed and special education staff around interventions and supports for all learners. So for this year, we're continuing under our school transformation grant to do MTSS implementation. Um, Parker High School in Barrows, we are hoping they're going to participate in the PBIS Academy. There was just a late email out today that the high school may be able to <coughs> slide into a spot, which is very exciting. Parker and Barrows, we're not sure. Um, I think Barrows, Barrows is, is all signed So up. Parker, we're not sure where they stand. But this is an exciting next step to get those buildings um, into a coaching model and getting them the professional development around MTSS and, and um, PBIS. We made a commitment that we're going to do an overview refresher for all staff at the building level on the MTSS process. So Sarah Bird will be going out and working with principals and the district MTSS team to do that so we can continue to reinforce the message that this is a priority for us as a district and that this is, this is something we're all doing. Um, we have rolled out the DCAP. So on the first two days of school, I had a traveling road show. I went to every building and I had the opportunity to give kind of a jump start overview on different topics. And the DCAP was one of those. The principals have made the DCAP available at the building level. So I've been in different buildings and seen the DCAP on the conference room table where they have data team meetings and principals are really working to integrate the DCAP into their conversations through their data teams and through their SST, their student support team, so that it is something that they're using in real time versus just asking people to read it. They're using it for real life um, work that um, staff are doing with students. We, the district MTSS team is going to be taking an inventory this year of all the interventions that we have available in the district so that we have a baseline of the supports that we provide for all learners, which will be exciting to be able to share out among the buildings. Um, we're going to continue to review the data on the students who are referred from the building teams for special education evaluations to make sure that those students that we are identifying as staff are uh, more accurate, that they are actually children in, who have disabilities through our child find process. Um, we're going to continue to work with data teams on reviewing academic and behavioral data as part of that MTSS process. We are identifying time during admin council or district leadership team meetings to discuss MTSS and progress um, on MTSS and reviewing data so that it's something that's part of the conversations we're having as an administrative team. And we are um, developing or we develop the MTSS action plan as an administrative council that has certain steps in place that we're going to be monitoring this year and that also connects to um, our goals as administrator and hopefully to teacher um, goals as well. In the next two to five years we need to continue to work on our MTSS implementation with the goal of getting 80% or higher on the TFI at all buildings at all tiers. So I know Sarah has shared with you the tiered fidelity instrument that looks at fidelity to um, our interventions at tier one, tier two, and tier three. Our goal is to get to 80% at each tier. Um, we need to work, the struggle that we have is really looking at the SST team is to identify tier three supports. From a philosophical framework perspective, our goal is to be at 80% in implementation of Tier 1, 80% implementation of Tier 2, then we would develop an SST team. But because we have the need 
to have this SST process, we're trying to balance how do we have a student support team when we're not quite at 80% fidelity for Tier 2. Um, and we need to increase the number of Tier 2 and Tier 3 interventions that are available at all levels. So once we've developed an inventory of what we have, we can see where we're missing interventions, and then we need to build those supports um, in place at all levels. So not just at elementary, but throughout the district. And that's where you might have potential budget implications because we may need staffing or resources to implement, whether it's academic or social emotional um, interventions. Um, so, the next big area that Walker identified is kind of a broad category of administrative needs. Um, so, over the last five years, there's been over 20 team chairs who have worked in the district. So, we've had a lot of turnover. In that position, we um, have also had a review in 2007. Some similar people, I don't think it was Walker, but similar group yes. came out and did an evaluation, and there were similar findings that hadn't been kind of rectified. So, concerns that we're not implementing recommendations from previous reports. We don't have a system in place. There wasn't documentation that our special ed programs are evaluated on an annual basis, which is something that the Department of Education requires. The role of the team chair has been unclear. Um, there's been four changes in my position since 2007. Um, the, there's, they brought up concerns about the structure of the Student Services Office and whether or not it provides appropriate supervision as needed for the programs within the district. And then our policies and procedures can be unclear. So depending on who the team chair was in a building, that might drive what certain buildings were doing versus being a district-wide um, policy or procedure. So this year, we increased the number of team chairs. So a lot of, you know, I'm relatively new, I still say that. And so the turnover that I had in team chairs was I couldn't really do an analysis based on the staff that I had, but getting a sense from my team chairs that stayed with me, the concerns that they shared were, there were salary concerns, um, there are concerns about caseload, which is why we increased the number of team chairs to make their caseloads more manageable. Um, our team chairs as administrators, they, um, are charged with completing all of their own paperwork related to the IEP process, which is quite extensive in terms of copying, mailing, they don't have any clerical support. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons for people leaving um, because they're not feeling supported. And I think also the other reason is the job really wasn't clear. Um, so we've been doing a lot of work this year to clarify that role. I will be finalizing the job description by October to just make sure that's clear. We've been working with principals to make sure they understand the role of the team chair, um, especially with such a new group that we have. Um, and I'm continuing to look at the structure of the Student Services Office to make sure that we can have the right support. I don't have the ideal vision yet, but um, it is a work in progre progress. We, I've been working this year with our new um, team chairs at the high school. I have Stephanie and Adam are my team chairs at the high school, and we've been working on the eligibility process and really refining how we go through that process with the high school staff. Um, as I said, I reviewed eligibility with all staff this school year, and I had a chance to review the evaluation from the 2007 and compare the findings. And I will say, you know, administrative structure was very similar. Um, administrative structure, those concerns were similar. The structure wasn't the same, but there were still concerns about how the office was structured and the type of supervision that was provided to the programs. Um, in the next two to five years, we do really need to think about our clerical support to better manage the student services office. Um, it's not just answering phones the amount of paperwork that comes in and out of the office and the, the requests for paperwork and our quick turnaround, it can be really challenging because we are very clerically thin. And so when we have requests, 
from either other districts or parents or attorneys to gather paperwork. It does take a lot of time, and I found myself running around to different places trying to find the paperwork that we need because we just don't always have it because you know we don't have one person who's at their job to manage that component. Um, we need to finalize our policy and procedure manual for special education. Last year I drafted a document and we kind of used it a little bit last year. I had the chance to go out to some of the buildings to gather feedback. I still need to get some more feedback so I can finalize that document. Um, and as I said, in the next two to five years, we really need to determine what does the structure need to be in the student services office because the student services office is not just special education, it's ELL, it's overseeing our homeless population, it is overseeing 504, nursing, I think those are my big ones. So, you know, it's not just um, a special education office, so making sure the structure um, is in place to support all of those components. Can I just add one piece to the last slide? So we didn't add from a monetary standpoint 2.4 positions. What we did um, is we restructured two point, we restructured two existing positions into team chair positions and used an additional piece of the IDA grant, 0.4, to fund the last piece. So we restructured uh, the high school department chair position, which Stephanie was in that role uh, last year. So that position is is now been restructured to a team chair position. And originally in the budget last year, you remember, we asked you for a TSP, SSP coordinator. We never went forward with that position. We felt because of the needs of this report that we needed the additional team chair. Um, so we restructured it for that team chair position. We felt that um, the, the role of the TSP, SSP coordinator would not have flourished in without the additional support from the, the team chair. So that was the rationale. So we, what we did not add money to the, the budget, just so you're aware. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about program development, because that was another, the next big area. So Walker really felt that we need to start looking and expanding and improving the programs that we do offer. Um, we have to make sure that our programs are consistent level to level, so um, that's a real important piece that we have this both horizontally aligned when we talk about our learning centers and vertically aligned when we talk about our programs. We need to look at all of our spaces. Um, some of that's beyond my purview, but I think to bring to your attention as the committee, to really understand that we have some inadequate spaces for our special education programs and we need to evaluate how we want to house those programs. Um, we need to look at our program, the SSP and TSB, our program for students with social emotional needs. We need to look at that program and the program structure and really look at adding counseling staff in some capacity to all of those programs and ensure that it's aligned vertically. And for all programs, we need to have entrance and exit criteria that's not only known by us or me, but by our school community and, um, and that parents are aware of that as well. So this year, to kind of address some of these needs, we've made the decision that through our PLC structure, that program teachers, so every special ed teacher who teaches in a program, when we have district PLC time, they will be meeting as a group, which means they will be meeting vertically, I think it is 13, 12, 12, 12 times this school year. And the charge of that work is for them to do the entrance and exit criteria to finalize their program descriptions. So that's an opportunity to make sure that they're aligned in their practices, in how, um, what type of students we service. Um, our learning center teachers, they will have designated time on other dates for them to work together. Our elementary group likes to work together horizontally to ensure that we have consistency among our elementary schools and the middle and high school work together vertically to be more aligned in their practices. Um, we need to continue to review all of our program spaces and do walkthroughs and, and see where people are located and what our needs might be. Um, we need to take a look at, at the middle and high school level, the ILT and DLC models. Um, we did make a decision this past
past year to add a DLC teacher to Coolidge. So one of the concerns uh, from the report was that the DLC program, the teacher in that program worked sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. Um, and so it was really difficult to do planning and support all those students' needs. So we were able to take another position and add it to Coolidge um, as a DLC special education teacher. We are also gonna be looking to rename our programs, which I'm very excited about. Um, one of the things that came out in the Walker Report is that we, um, as a school community, refer to students by the program name, and we really need to move away from that. So that will be part of the work that our PLCs will be doing, is coming up with names for the programs that are not labeling of students and the disability type. So I'm very excited that that work will be happening this year. I know it'll be a little confusing for people as we walk through, but we can create a crosswalk so people know what programs we're talking about. Um, we are gonna be providing this year to support some of the programmatic needs. We've reached out to North Shore Consortium and created a consulting contract with them. They are going to come into our social emotional programs and provide consultation um, monthly to those programs to make sure that they are implementing the clinical groups that they were trained in last year. So all of the teachers in the SSP and TSP programs last year were provided um, training in DBT and CBT so that they can implement those groups. And the goal this year with North Shore Consortium is to continue to provide the professional staff with consultation so that they can implement those clinical programs. We're also using North Shore Consortium to provide clinical supervision for all of our counseling staff. So one of the pieces in the report that came out is that we're not providing school psychologists and our school adjustment counselors with the opportunity to have regular supervision to discuss challenging cases in a confidential manner. So uh, we will have licensed clinical social workers from North Shore Consortium coming in to provide that clinical supervision on a monthly basis for all of our counseling staff. Um, we have relocated the TSP classroom at the high school, so it was previously located downstairs near the cafeteria. It's now been located so that it's next to the SSP classroom and the guidance suite. So we think that that's a better spot for that, those students. We've also relocated where the in-school suspension and the students who are being reintegrated from hospitalization, um, they don't share a space anymore. So those have been separated. We have a special ed teacher who returned through to teach in the TSP program from last year and we were able to hire a new social worker for the TSP program. So those programs at the high school level are fully staffed. Um, the post program, just to give you a little update, we're very excited, they now have a van they are starting a copy center and going to be, we're going to be giving them their own um, email address so we can email them work to do, um, large copying projects. They have been helping with the mail in the um, high school office. They've reached out to Debbie at RISE to potentially do some internships down in the preschool. They are doing some work in my office. They've been out in the community. Last week they went to Smolak Farm. Um, they're working closely with the recreational therapist from Seam to identify students' interests. So we think so far, so good. Everyone seems pretty happy in their space. Um, in the next two to five years, we do need to look at space, which has a budget implication. We need to look at restructuring our TSP and SSP program to make sure we have the right type of staffing and the curriculum and materials that they need in that classroom. Um, we need to look at our high school um, support model. So as you read in the report, a lot of our supports at the high school are done through a pull-out model or the learning center, and we needed to look at some different options through that. Um, and then we need to develop guidelines for how we go about getting more support. So when um, staff feel that they need a paraprofessional, they need additional support, we need to have some guidelines to help IEP teams in making those decisions um, so that we have more consistency in making those, how, those decisions. Um, so co-teaching is the next big area. 
So Walker spent a lot of time talking in their reports about sort of how we have some inconsistent models. We do some co-teaching here. Um, Birch Meadow does a lot of co-teaching. Barrows continues to have a fifth grade co-teaching. And here at the high school, um, we have co-teaching models. But we don't have a clear, consistent approach to co-teaching. We don't have a definition. We don't have guidelines. Um, their recommendation is that you know, we need to have a manual, we need to have kind of a clear um, definition of all of us as administrators about what co-teaching is. Because I think if we went into a classroom, we would all view what's happening in that classroom very differently. So what was observed is that a lot of times um, in those co-teaching environments, there were two different lessons happening. The special educator might be working with the students identified on IEPs, and the general education classroom teacher is working with those students who are not. And so that, Walker felt we needed to do a lot more work on what does a co-teaching classroom look like. So we discussed at Administrative Council that it wasn't realistic this year to really change sort of that practice with the little time we have together as an Administrative Council. So the priority this year is really for us as an administrative council, including team chairs, principals, assistant principals, to come up with a shared definition of co-teaching and then, the, and then also a definition of in-class support. So for some classrooms, we, they have co-teaching and what does that look like and what are we defining that as? And in other classrooms, we may have people coming in to provide in-class support and what does that mean and what, is, what are we defining that as? So our goal this year is really to define those terms as an administrative council, because having clarity on that will allow us then to move forward for the next steps. And then once we've defined that, to create an action plan. Where do we want to build these co-teaching relationships? What's the professional development? How do we go? Um, what are the action steps we need to take? Um, the elementary learning center teachers in their horizontal meeting, they will be spending time talking about co-teaching because that's something they're very interested in discussing further. So they will be working on that. And that as an administrative council, we'll be do, going out and doing some walkthroughs. So one of the environments we really want to look at is some of the co-teaching environments and what does that really mean for all of us. Um, so as I said, the next two to five years is really the idea the development of an action plan, and then what are going to be our staffing needs. Do we need more special education teachers? Do we not? And really identifying what that looks like and how we're going to implement it. We had a lot of recommendations and findings around professional development. So people always want more professional development. We never seem to have enough time to do that. But the feedback was that we really need to have a comprehensive approach to how we're training staff on special education. Um, staff are looking for more frequent, in-depth training opportunities. Um, as we talked about the eligibility process, people want to provide more training and support for our paraprofessionals, training for team chairs, um, more support for general education staff and understanding the role of special educators and sharing out program information. I think that was a common theme you'll see throughout the report is what are the programs that we have, how are we evaluating them, and how are we sharing out information. So this year, as I said, we reviewed the eligibility process. Um, during the induction week, I had an opportunity to meet with the new staff and talk about special education. Alan Bloom came in and met with all the new staff to talk about general education and special education. I worked with the team chairs to finalize a document that's called Goals and Responsibilities that talks about who is responsible for what part of the IEP process to provide some clarity and to create some consistency. Again, so it's not person dependent, it's actually what we do across the district. Um, and this year, we're going to continue to work with Alan Bloom on the special education, where special education and general education intersect. Because staff have really wanted him to come back. We've gotten a lot of positive feedback. He also presented a blue ribbon last year. And we have lots of principals and teaching staff who wanted to come back. 
Um, some of the professional development priorities that we've identified for this year, we are going to be sending over 50 staff to the Social Thinking Conference that's in Boston. So that's really teaching staff about social skills development. It's giving staff strategies on self-regulation. There are also going to be sessions for um, teaching executive functioning skills for older students. So we're very excited that it's going to be grant funded and um, it, the substitutes will also be covered through the grant. I mentioned the clinical supervision and consultation. This is a relationship that's ongoing. So staff really want that ongoing, in-depth coaching model. So that's what North Shore will be providing. We're going to continue, as we did last year through our grant, we had a BCBA come from SEAM to consult to our social and emotional programs. So this is grant funded, so it allows us to really target um, the needs of those programs. So it's very direct, and again, it's a coaching model where the BCBA comes in and is, is monitoring what people are doing, is coaching paraprofessionals, and modeling how to work with students. Um, we're using our in-district BCBA this year that we hired, which has been a really great hire. She's supporting our ILP, our DLC, and our COMPASS programs. So she's not only meeting IEP needs, but she's doing coaching with staff, and she's going to be providing some training for our paraprofessionals and our professional staff on some of the professional development days. Um, we are going to be sending some of our ILP and DLC staff to a training called Introduction to Verbal and Behavioral Training, which is for students who are nonverbal. And this, again, would be grant funded, so that's a great opportunity. We're having um, a woman from UMass Boston who will be coming out to the district on October 13th on our Professional Development Day, who's going to be doing some work with our middle school and high school staff on person-centered planning and transition planning. So as students meet that are 14 years and older, um, and they become part of the process, she's going to be doing some training. It's a full day training, um, and I'm very excited to have her come out. We're sending staff to the Mass Down Syndrome Congress Educator Forum. We have we've established a consulting contract with the Landmark School this year. They're going to be working with our language-based programs at Eaton, Parker, and the high school. They will also be coming out on the professional day to do training with um, special educators, paraprofessionals, and some of our classroom teachers. And they'll be doing a coaching and consultation model throughout the school year and working with those each building to help them improve their language-based programs. And as I mentioned before, we're going to continue to work with Alan Bloom. Um, the next steps for professional development is really thinking about like what's going to be our comprehensive plan to make sure we're addressing all areas that are priorities. Um, we want to make sure that we, as we put together our plan, have opportunities to work with all staff to go over key issues in special education. The challenge, I think, is just time and finding that time to meet with when there's competing interests. Um, and then we need to continue to get the feedback from staff to make sure we're matching what we're offering with what they feel is the priority. Another area that we struggle with is transition, which is preschool to elementary, elementary to middle, and middle to high school. Um, we don't seem to have a consistent process for transitioning students, and again, I think it's been person dependent in the role versus a district-wide process for transitioning students. So as an administrative council, we agree that this is a priority area that we're going to be working on so that we have a written plan in place and that we can communicate out to staff and families that this is our transition process. We need to start it early. We need to communicate it out. Um, and we need to make sure that we're being consistent um, level to level and um, building to building. And then once we start the process, we need to monitor it to make sure that we're continuing to implement it. It makes a big difference. All of us as parents, our anxiety level increases when we're looking at that next level. And when we're thinking of students with disabilities, their parents have even more anxiety about that transition. So we really need to think about how we're transitioning students and being thoughtful both for parents, students, and for the receiving staff. Parental awareness and support. So this is an area I think that 
has been a struggle in terms of the official CPAC. Um, we really, last year I made numerous attempts um, to get parents involved. I offered many meetings and unfortunately I think our most well attended meeting was the first one. That was like a meet and greet. We had about 20 parents and then from that point on it was five, six, eight parents at the max. So, and no real leadership team came forward. So um, that's really been a challenge in terms of how to get that structure going and how to find some parents who want to take on that leadership role. So this year I'm going to be offering four training topics. The Department of Education has issued some new guidance for us on how, what we can do. And so one option is to provide training topics for parents throughout the school year. And then maybe through that process we'll have some parents who come forward who'd really like to take a leadership role and be part of the CPAC. It would be great to have a group of parents who could act as advisory, um, but unfortunately we just don't have an organized group. People come in and out of my office, but no one seems to want to be on that leadership core. Um, we need to, so this ties in is, we need to improve um, parent education on disabilities and understanding their own child's disability. So that can happen through the IEP process, but it may be one of the topics that we have to offer to parents through our parent training. Uh, we need to make sure parents feel that they're an integra integral member of the IEP process. We need to develop a parental engagement process that is consistent across the district so parents feel engaged in special education. And again, program descriptions. We, that's kind of a repeated theme that making sure parents can find it and are aware of that. This year, as I said, we'll do four meetings of the CPAC. Um, I'll be sending out a communication to parents um, via mail by October 15th. So I last year started a process of sending a kind of a welcome letter um, along with the notice of procedural safeguards. So that will actually the, the post program is going to be doing the mailing, um, which I'm very excited about. So they'll be collating and um, putting everything in the envelopes and sending that all out. So by October 15th, that will all be sent in the mail, and in there will be all the dates for the CPAC meetings, and I usually give a little update, you know, let them know who the new team chairs are. Um, so our members of the parents' um, special education PAC are going to be included in the communication audit to see if they have any feedback to us on that. I'm going to try to add more information to the Student Services website, get that be a place where parents can find more information and make it a little more user friendly because there's a lot of information on there but it's not all easily accessible. Um, we have a team meeting survey form that we provide to every parent at the end of an IEP meeting and it's sent back to my office. We're going to continue that process. Actually the post program, they folded them for us and they've been distributed to the team chair so at the end of every meeting they're given to parents and parents are encouraged to send them back they can fill them out anonymously or not but we don't get a, a lot of them but it would be great to get more of them i'm also going to be sending a survey out to all the parents who participated in our extended school year program because i'd like to get some feedback from parents i've heard from the staff about what they would like to improve but I'd like to hear from parents about what they feel could be improved. And that's really it. There's a lot of information there. I didn't go into everything, but tried to hit on the, the highlights. Did you guys have questions about the report? Yeah, I just want to say that I think it's really well done, and I, I commend you for your candor. Um, it's not something that always happens. It's not just you know, in school, not, not pointing to the right, but it's hard to look at your program and say, here's where we are, and here's where we need to go. And I think you've done a terrific job. I commend you and Dr. Doherty uh, for doing it, because uh, there has been, over the years, lots of talk about, you know, the, the special education program, and of course, with, you know, four different leaders over seven years, um, it hasn't been able to move forward. And I just want to say, from my perspective, I think you're doing a great job, and we hope I know I've talked to other school committee members too. I can't speak for all of them, but we're you know we're very happy with your performance, and you know hope you're going to stick around and see this to the finish. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, along those lines, uh, what kind of 
date will we, I mean, I, I'd like to, you know, maybe have a report mm -hmm. six months from yeah. now to find out mm -hmm. uh, where so we are with all these. Uh, good question. Um, there is, there is already something in the calendar as part of our topic based. I can't remember which date we put down, but. Um, uh, April 26th. scheduled CPAC meetings for the year I think is really smart because parents can kind of know, yeah. all right, these are when they're going to be. Um, I guess I'd like to express a desire, not just to you, but to parents who might be watching this. It would be really great if some committed parents would come together and serve as an advisory council because I think it really adds their voices mm -hmm. in a powerful way. So um, I'll leave it at that. But thank you. And I just want to thank my team chairs that came tonight to be here. They took time out of their evening to come and support, and it's exciting to have some new strong administrators be part of our team. So, Um, so included in your packet for tonight's meeting was, um, was an update on the modular classroom project. As you all know, we moved into both the Killam and the Barrows Elementary modular zone. The Barrows move happened over the weekend, and the students started there this morning with uh, um, a ribbon cutting ceremony at, uh, at Barrows as well. Um, uh, my, my outline uh, talked a little bit about the punch list, um, and, and we're learning a little bit as we get each modular comes on board. Um, you know, uh, when we moved into the Killam one, we realized that there's a need for shelving, so uh, the shelving has been added in the Killam modular by our maintenance staff. It was put into Barrows over the weekend as part of that move, and it'll be put into Eaton too. So we're, we're learning as we, as we are mobilizing uh, into the modulars. Um, the punch list was very similar for both Killam and Barrows in terms of things that needed to be done. Most of them have been addressed already, like the light bulb switching out and the adding the signage and things along that matter. Um, what will be done over the next 30 days at all three of them is the installation of the gutters and the downspouts and the, the different overhangs. Those take uh, carpenter skills and they take multiple days to, to build and to put onto the units. So those will be done over the next 30 days, but they, they have not been at this point. Um, I believe Kiln will be done this weekend, which should be done by Wednesday of next week. So, um, and they're trying to be mindful of the fact that the buildings are now occupied, so they can't be up there banging during the day, so they're going to be doing this work on, you know, Wednesday afternoons or Saturday, you know, late Friday into Saturday, so they're being mindful of, of the school day as well. Um, the temporary fencing has been removed, the general cleanup has occurred. So we really do uh, appreciate the temporary occupancy permit and, and <coughs> expect to get a 30-day permanent uh, permit in 30 days once all the punch list is taken care of. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the budget. Um, we were approved for a budget of 1.2 million, um, and as you know, at the plan finance committee meeting on the 16th of September, we did request and, and were given an additional 75,000 uh, to shore up the budget to complete this project. Um, the majority of the capital appropriation that we were given went to uh, the Vanguard contract. The contract came in at a million one seven, uh, or excuse me, a million uh, seventeen thousand, um, which which did use up the bulk of the one point two million. Um, we have had a number of change orders that have come through, and, and I tried to group them uh, in the narrative here, but the, the majority of the change orders, a big portion of them, almost nineteen thousand dollars were for site conditions. So we encountered boulders at every single site. And Vanguard, in their proposal, had planned on coming in and using an auger method to just kind of, um, to use a better expression, like a knife through butter, you know, just to kind of cut through and, and get the trenching done. And they encountered boulders, which means they had to bring in excavation crews um, and then remove the boulders from the site. So a, a big portion of the change orders were for unforeseen site conditions. Um, the next biggest category of change orders were really for um, what I would call town regulations. 
um, and it had a lot to do with uh, engineering requirements when it came to water and sewer. Um, so Vanguard's proposal um, included four-inch pipe, um, town requirements is six-inch. So there's an example of a change order that came through. Um, same thing when it came to uh, uh, at Barrows, the site particularly, uh, there was a, a, and this is where, uh, forgive me, I'm not an engineer, but it had to do with a drop sewer hookup versus an outside of the sewer hookup. So you know, there was another change order that came. So, so some of them have been um, because of town requirements. And um, uh, the other large one uh, had to do with the ramps. So initially the proposal included just a straight ramp which is what you'll see at the Eaton modular when that one uh, opens, hopefully next Monday. Um, but uh, at the Barrows and Killam, it's, it's what's called a switchback ramp. So because of the proximity of the building, modular building, to the school building, we had to maintain that 20-foot egress for safety equipment, for fire and safety equipment. And so they had to do a switchback ramp so that they weren't in, uh, impairing that, that egress. Um, the last few little ones had to do with you know a pounded post fence, um, lattice work for the decks, as you've seen at the Eaton and, and uh, Killam modulars, we, we uh, put lattice work up to, to uh, beautification of, of, the, of the modular um, and some stone installation uh, around the, the grounds of the modular. So the rest of them are, are, are very small dollar and didn't really fit into a category. Um, as far as the, the projected costs, I did include a table there um, to try and highlight some of the bigger costs. Um, obviously, the cost of the units themselves, the site preparation and utility tie-in. Um, we did make a decision early on in the project, given that it was three sites, that an OPM would be uh, beneficial, and, and we have uh, really benefited from having Gale on site um, from their engineering expertise and just keeping the journals of you know who's there and what's happening on a daily basis has been very, very uh, helpful to both Joe Huggins, myself, and Dr. Daugherty. Um, and so at this point, we have about $24,000, $25,000 left in the contingency um, to bring us up to the 1.275. And at this point in the project, we, we feel very comfortable that the, the 1.275 should, should get the project to completion. Yeah. Just a quick question about the, the punch list. And you said it would require a carpenter to do the gutters and downspouts. Is that in this, or is that coming from the HSBC? Oh, no, it's already in there. It's, already in there. It, it's part of the contracted price with Vanguard. Oh. It's, it's something they have to deliver. They just haven't finished it. Oh, okay. I, yeah. Yeah, the way you said it would try to require a contractor or, or a, a carpenter, oh. I thought maybe we were going outside. No. Oh, no, no, so no, no. no. Vanguard, it's it's okay. Vanguard uh, that, that's doing it. The same people that built the decks yeah. are going to be building this. Right. So. Okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I was curious that when they uh, the switch back, wouldn't they have known that when they were putting the, they knew where the sites were going to be, uh, that they discovered they needed to do that. I mean, that seems to me that it shouldn't be a change order. Uh, well, I, I think what happens is, you know, you, you submit a bid, but then when you get to the actual site and start measuring it and looking at exactly what needs to be done, and then you have conversations with fire uh, department, which, which has its, you know, um, mm -hmm. Own requirements, then that's what the you know that's what led to the switch back ramp. Yeah. So I'm not sure if we'll be building any more of these, <laughs> but <laughs> it would be totally surprised if we did. <laughs> but um, have we learned through this process of um, you know steps that we might take to avoid um, potential um, change orders, such as like the six inch pipe? Also, the four-inch pipe. Can we, um, you know, make the bids more specific? I guess so that uh, in the event that we, you know, potentially could have another module in place somewhere, um, does that make sense? One thing. Yeah, no, absolutely does. Um, <coughs> thank you for the question. Definitely, there have been some lessons learned with uh, with how we structured our proposal and, and where we could have been more specific about what we wanted versus. Um, um, we use the phrase town standard quite a bit in our contract with them, you know, to the town standard, to the town standard. But if there's nothing documented what the town standard is, then the person who's bidding is, is bidding with what their standard is, which is, you know, four inch um, pipe. So, um, so definitely there have been some lessons learned if in the event that we are going to add more at some time, 
um, we certainly would uh, probably have a more thoughtful development of the RFP. I think um, the addition of Joe Huggins to the role of, uh, what's the name of this job now? Director of Facilities. Facilities. Director of Facilities. I think would enhance that likelihood too. So I think that was a, a good move in terms of being able to establish that facility with someone with that type of knowledge. I, I agree. school and the fall sports are basically into their seasons now. Um, today was actually the first RMHS singers rehearsal. Um, I, I was at six today. Um, the drama club is putting on Mary Poppins and they have begun rehearsing and many clubs are starting to speak. who is a former first grade teacher at Woodland School in Birch Meadow, taught here for a long time, unfortunately passed away this summer from uh, very quickly from um, pancreatic cancer. It's a, a 5K walkathon. It's a very family-friendly event. Um, I'll be working on in, in terms of uh, setting up, helping out whatever way I can and, um, uh, as, as many uh, Woodland staff and former Birch Meadow staff are working on too. So, if you would like to uh, register for it, there is a website. Um, it's uh, smilesforsally.org, and um, you'll get all that information there. Thank you. Um, the Human Relations Advisory Committee was at the street fair and was is very grateful for all the people that stopped by. There were great conversations and a lot of interest in joining the committee. So we're hoping to see all those interested on October 1st, that's a Thursday at 7 at the police station, for our next meeting. One thing I forgot to mention, yes. sorry. It, the, the, uh, the point of the, uh, the walk is to raise funds for a scholarship through the Writing Scholarship Foundation um, that we I think potentially right now they're talking about, you know, for a graduating wearing high school senior who's going to go into the field of education of the arts. Thank you. Dr. Dark. Yeah, so I, I only had one thing to report out. Um, it was just that uh, the town accountant was able to close uh, fiscal 15 on Friday the 18th, and which didn't leave me enough time to get a final. Uh, FY15 presentation for you also for your next meeting I will have the final FY15 uh, financial update if you will so is that let you know. certified through cash numbers <laughs> well, just our budget no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I make no promises that's about an October cash. Yeah. That yeah. <laughs> so that was that was the only thing I had I have several items um, so first I'm going to just pass this out this is in a similar format in the packet um, I did mention to you, I believe it was the last meeting, that the, uh, we're, we're hoping to share that we're, instead of having school-based presentations, we're going to do more topic-based presentations that our schools will be involved with. Um, so this is a draft, and as always, this is going to be subject to um, timing of different uh, presenters and, and events, but this is right now what we have planned for major topics during the year. Now certainly other things will be added as we go throughout the year. We try to, as much as possible, have one major topic, because um, we always know there's other areas that are going to be on an agenda that will be discussed as well. Um, but you can see that we're um, trying to hit all of the key areas that are aligned with our goals and our action plans so that we can report out to you um, periodically and in a timely manner throughout, throughout the year um, updates so that you have that, that information. Um, so for example, this Saturday, which uh, I know probably 
Gene will want to talk about later, is the, is the retreat where we're going to have Dorothy Presser come and uh, do a workshop um, with, through the district governance project. Next, which I guess is now going to be Tuesday's school committee meeting, will be the report. I'm going to present to you the, the, the results of the focus groups uh, from last year as well as some other data. Um, and then the uh, evaluation will be also next, um, next week. But you can see, um, and then a treat on October 5th is we're going to go and visit a modular classroom and we'll be killing teachers and students there, I believe. Um, Giles and, and company will be uh, doing a short presentation there. We're also going to have uh, that evening, um, the communication audit will be, um, uh, will, the person from National School Public Relations um, Association is going to come and ask focus group questions to the school committee um, as part of that. And then uh, Linda Williams is going to be giving you a guidance report. So those are the next upcoming meetings. But you can see that there are, throughout the year, there are, there are several topics of interest that we'll be reporting to you on. It's in it's in the packet. It's in, it's it's in the packet, the and I am going to put it in my blog. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah. It, yes, it will yeah. be. This is yeah. So there are several other items that I want to share with you this evening. So the first one is, um, I, I know we wanted to talk a little bit about the the two days of school that we had that normally we have not had the last several years because of the Jewish holidays. Um, so this is a breakdown of the teacher absences and the student absences for September 14th and 15th. And I, we, so we've only been in school for a few weeks, so the average daily absence is obviously um, a very small um, amount. That we're, that, we're, that we're a sample size that we're looking at. But you can see that we've been averaging approximately two teachers a, a day at each of our schools um, for absences for a variety of reasons. Um, and uh, students, you can see at the high school, we've been averaging 39 students, 16 at the middle school. Um, and that's combined for the middle schools, and 24 at the elementary, and that's also combined. Um, so you can see on the, the holidays, um, what you see is the, uh, the first number is the number of teachers that were out on September 14th um, at the high school for, re for the religious holiday, and then the total number of teachers that were out for that day. Um, and then you can see, which is, so no teachers were out for religious observance, and one teacher was out at the high school on the 14th. At the middle school, five teachers were out for religious observance, and seven total teachers were out. And then at the elementary school, two and 11. And then on for students, um, same, uh, you see at the high school, 14 students were out for religious observance, 53 total, seven and 25 at the middle school, and 12 and 52 at the elementary. Um, it did decrease on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. So that, that's the data. Uh, certainly we will take additional data for Yom Kippur, uh, which begins uh, tomorrow night and then continues on Wednesday. Yeah. Have you gotten any feedback from teachers or from students or from families about the accommodation policy in the institution? I have not. That's a good thing. No I, I've not heard anything either way. Right. Okay. I have, tomorrow we're meeting with principals, so I will ask them um, if they've heard anything. But I've not heard anything. Because I know in the past, way back, past the year. Uh, yes. If there were problems. I mean, we have we've made a point of emphasizing the the accommodation policy um, over the last few weeks. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, this is something, and I will I will send you the preliminary. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. There was a little. I just had a question. If people did have um, feedback 
or questions on how the accommodation policy has been implemented. I know everything is a process and everyone's learning um, and there, what I'm wondering is if people have questions, who should they direct their questions to? Obviously they should talk to their teachers first, mm -hmm. but in terms of feedback for us to consider um, when we're voting again on our calendar, where should people send their feedback about how? I would, I would, they could send it to me. Okay, thank you. Okay. This is um, the first part of the Chapter 70 Commission's preliminary report. I will send you the part one report electronically. Um, it was released on June 30th, and I apologize that I haven't gotten this information to you earlier. It's just we've had so many other things going on um, between modular classrooms and the start of school that I, I wanted to share this information. It, it is very interesting information. So at this point, the commission has had several <coughs> hearings um, all last spring um, and really looked at a variety of, of issues regarding the current Chapter 70 formula and what should be changed. Um, for the most part, the formula hasn't changed much since 1993, and there were a lot of things in 1993 in education that are, were different than they are now. Um, the first part of the report took a look at just two areas, uh, special education um, and healthcare costs. And what they, what they did, uh, DESE did, is based on the findings of part one of the commission, uh, they did a simulation of how much each community would get in additional funding. This is a one year snapshot now that we would get additional chapter 70 funding if it was fully funded in the formula for just special education and health insurance costs. So you can see that number way over to the right, the arrow, I don't know if you can see it, 3 million, looks like 208,000, 641 is what the town of Reading would receive in additional Chapter 70 funding money um, if we were fully funded for the changes that have occurred and the increases that have occurred in special education and health insurance since 1993. Um, now, realistically, the state is not going to be able to fund that all in one year. So if this is ever to come to fruition, it would be done over a several year span. Um, the last time there was this inequity in school-based funding in, the chap in Chapter 70, uh, it took seven years to get everyone up to the level um, that they were supposed to be at. So this is part one of the report. The second part of the report is due on to the legislature on November 1st, and it's gonna examine the following costs and its impact which include all of these areas, in-district special education rate. The other, uh, part one just looked at out-of-district special education costs. Low income, so that is the, the poverty index of a community, ELL, mental health and wraparound services, uh, professional development, common planning time, and instructional coach expenses, extended learning time, technology, full-day preschool, pupil-teacher ratios in K-3, to operations and maintenance, and inflation adjustment. So all of these things are going to be looked at in the second part of the report, which is due on November 1st to the legislature. So what will happen is the legislature will take all of this information and then most likely will start developing um, a formula that will be subject to appropriation, but um, you, know, you can see that, that there has been this inequity in the Chapter 70 funding formula for many years. And some communities like Reading, it's been a huge inequity. So I wanted to share that that piece with you. I don't, yeah. There's nothing regarding full day kindergarten, it's just full day preschool. Um yes. Right now, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. For our next topic, <laughs> M Casson Park. So today um, the Board of Education met, and um, actually I'll, I'll pass this out to you in a second, there's this press release that was embargoed 
until five o'clock, but now we can we can pass it out. Um, so the, today the board of education met and they gave and uh, and, and what's going to happen now is going to be a series of board of education meetings throughout the fall that are going to educate the board and the community about the park and the MCAS and also um, releasing some results along the way. So today uh, took more of a, a global view of the park and the MCAS, how we got to this point, the, what each test is, um, the strengths of each test, um, and they also released the preliminary state results for both PARC and for MCAS. Um, well, they released the preliminary results for PARC and the statewide results uh, for, for MCAS. So I'll, I'll show you with those in a second. Um, on either September 24th or 25th, which is this coming Thursday or Friday, the MCAS results will, will be released. So what does that mean for Reading? Um, that means five, eight, and nine science and at the high school grade 10 and at mathematics and ELA. Um, so we do, we are sending, we are preparing a release um, and we will be sending out the school and the district information once the embargo is lifted. There is an embargo right now on all of the data. Um, so once that's lifted either Thursday or Friday, we will be sending something out uh, to, the, to the community. Um, the high school, since it will have complete MCAS results, and they did not take part, uh, will be doing a presentation in the upcoming week, it's most likely at one of their PTO meetings. Um, K to eight in the district will have a full presentation once PARC results are released, because all we have right now are the science results. Um, it is estimated right now that's gonna be in November. And then individual student reports are gonna be shipped to the school, um, to, our, to, to the district the 24th or the 25th, they come here, we get them into envelopes. It usually takes a week to, to get those um, sent out to the schools. Um, although actually may take less because we don't have as many reports this time. On October 19th and 20th, the Board of Education will have two meetings and they'll be getting at that time more PARC and MCAS results and there will be a continued discussion um, at that board meeting. Late October or early November, we are going to see final park statewide results. Right now, you're only going to see the preliminary. Um, and we will start getting the park district and school results. And then the accountability results for all districts and schools will be released at that time as well. Remember, we can't, the state cannot give us our accountability results until um, both the park and MCAS results are completed. Um, Is that? Embargo, something new. What do you no, go to jail we, if you don't if you go out before the embargo? I, mean, I don't know what they would do to us, but <laughs> I think they've always used that. They've term. always used that term. Um, early November, the commissioner is going to give a recommendation on the state assessment. Which state assessment to the Board of Education? <clears throat> November sixteenth is going to be a final public hearing. I believe it's going to be at the DESE. Uh, in Malden um, on the state assessment. It will give the, the public one last opportunity uh, to give their point of view. There have been, by the way, several hearings already on, uh, again, in the spring on, on the park and MCAS. Um, on November 17th, the board is gonna vote on the commissioner's recommendation. Um, and then in December, individual student reports will be shipped in December. So we will have school and district results before December, but uh, families will not receive individual student reports until December. Um, and then December 14th and 15th, if the Board of Education adopts PARC, there'll be a discussion on the next piece, which will not occur for a few years, but need to figure out about when the high school test will begin and the competency determination for the graduation requirements. If PARC is not adopted, then there's going to be a discussion of possible changes to the current MCAS and upgrades to it. Um, so that's really where we're at with um, the timeline. I'm going to pass out to you the embargoed press release, which has now been released. I saw it in the Globe Online this evening. So um, 
I'll just share with you some statewide MCAS results. I don't know if you can see those, but you're gonna get you're gonna get it in that press release as well. Um, so the statewide MCAS results are listed there. Um, the, 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 the one thing to remember is that for grades three through um, eight, um, this is not the entire state anymore. This is, I believe, 46% of the school districts took MCAS this year. So the results now are um, not the entire state. And for the high school, it is the entire state. And then here are the preliminary park results for the computer-based tests only, not the paper, because there were some districts that did the paper-based test um, for grades three through eight. And um, not surprising, the, the park results are lower than the MCAS results, and that was expected because it is a more rigorous assessment. Yes. Dr. Doherty, pardon me if you've already explained the chart, but I'm not seeing it because I'm just looking at it. But how do we compare, so there's four MCAS categories and five park categories. Mm -hmm. How can you sort of see, well, what's a one on park versus warning failing on MCAS? Is, is the EES even going to provide us anything to help us bridge this and connect the two? Eventually, results? they are, yes. Eventually, okay. Yeah. Because that would be very helpful. It's a little bit hard to to compare these. Okay. Thanks. Well, it's not. Yeah, it, it's two different tests, so it's not. It's it's you talk about the rating. Right. Yeah. It, like because it, it, it really is two different tests. It's like compares apples and oranges. Um, so because we went to park, we're, we're held harmless this year in the accountability rating, we can only go up. Okay. Will we, will we get a rating, actually? We oh, yeah. No, we'll get a rating. So based on... We'll get a rating on, based on both the MCAS and the park scores. Right. There's a formula to determine the accountability rating. Um, so the science MCAS scores are part of that, mm -hmm. that formula. Um, and so once the park scores come in, they'll be able to determine the accountability rate. Would we know if we had, well, so we wouldn't know if we improved, but we wouldn't necessarily know if we, um, if, if the uh, fortunes of another school became a level three. Would, would we know that or not? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that. I think we would. We would if, I think we would, but we're, either way, we would be held harmless. Right. And then regardless of the whether or not they adopt PARC. Next, this year's fifth, eighth, science, they're still on cast in the high school. You mean last year? No, mean, oh, this, this upcoming year? year? Science, science will always be on cast right. until further notice. Um, and the high school, until the graduating class of 2019, will be on cast. That's, that's it. Carl, did you have a report? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. So um, definitely this year, of all my years at the high school, from junior to senior year, I've seen the most changes implemented at the high school. I think that's definitely a testament to uh, Mr. Barker. But uh, we have senior privileges now, so if you're a senior, you have a study A block or G block, you can either come in late or uh, leave early, which I think is great, makes sense. Um, like the detentions, like they're now like an hour and 30 minutes late, you don't see as many kids staggering in late. I know I don't, you know, I don't gamble anymore. Um, <laughs> so I, it's good and I mean, even like Reese's Pizza is now served in the cafeteria, which is really good. 
Um, over the summer, uh, Mr. Zay, I met with all the leaders at the high school said so includes um, the captains of the sports teams, uh, student council, um, class officers, like all the, um, yeah, it was all grades. And he was just explaining how to like, conduct yourself at the high school, some team building activities, so that stuff was helpful. And uh, I mean, Mr. Bacher, again, I think he's, I see him in the halls all the time, like he's really friendly with the kids, so I think he's doing a good job. Yeah, well, can you elaborate on the senior pri privileges? So, everybody, all seniors have those privileges, or do you have to have a certain grade point average? Oh, yeah. Or? Yeah, so you have to maintain above a 2.0 GPA. Um, you can't have any, like, disciplinary issues. So, like, a suspension would get them revoked. Um, and you can't, you can't be late, like, mm -hmm. I think it's, like, two or three times, and, or else they'll take them away. Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. And do you think if we're, we're monitoring that anyways, uh, time is anyways, mm -hmm. to see yes. the impact that this can have on it. So some really good ideas mm -hmm. in, in how the students feel similar to the way you feel, Kyle. Oh yeah, they, they love it. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why. <clears throat> but there's some accountability too, so. Oh yeah. Good stuff. <clears throat> Great, thanks, Carl. Mm -hmm. No, I'm, I'm, no. And we have some uh, donations. Yeah. Mr. Chair, we could accept a donation in the amount of $1,500 from the Friends of Running Field Hockey to use to support the coaching assistance for the 2015 season. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Five, zero. Mr. Chair, move to accept a donation in the amount of $1,250 from the Reading Volleyball Parents Organization to be used to support the coaching assistance for the 2015 season. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All those in favor? Five, zero. Mr. Chair, move to accept a donation in the amount of $2,400 from the Friends of RMHS Cheering to be used to purchase choreographer services and the corresponding music for the 2015 competition season. Is there a second? Second. Yes. Thank you. Um, the, so the description is that this pays for choreography and music, but the details of the 2400 list choreography service and an individual to me. And I was just wondering what how that breaks into the choreography and music. Sure. Um, the choreography, the actual dance routine is being designed by Extreme Choreography. The actual music was sent and, and compiled by Nicole, by okay. the other person. So that's so the music component. The music component. Yeah. Yeah. Think, of it, think of it as audio and dance. So Beautiful. the audio component was, was compiled by Nicole. Thank you. Mr. Chair, move to accept a donation from the Catalano family in the amount of $500 to the Coolidge Middle School to be used to support the band and chime choir expenses and the art department. Is there a second? Second. second. Discussion? Yes. Mr. Chair, if you would indulge me, the, the donors wrote a letter, and if I could just read one tiny part of it, sure. would, would that be okay? Um, the, the donors wrote a really beautiful letter, but they specifically wanted to acknowledge some staff, and it seems appropriate to just read that. Um, this donation is made to honor all the wonderful staff we've encountered through the years for excellence in teaching while nurturing and inspiring students. Some people make a lasting impression either through the knowledge and wisdom they helped impart or through the caring and kindness shown. Our deepest appreciation goes to Ms. Weber, Mr. Mulligan, Mr. Bernard, Mr. Henneberry, Ms. Anderson, Ms. Mr. Madej, Ms. Lebeau, Ms. Duan, Miss Ventura, Miss Zani, Miss Mungansat. Thank you very much. <laughs> My kids don't go to college. And Mr. Mercado. Um, they very specifically say to all the staff, but they didn't acknowledge that, so I wanted to acknowledge that. Thanks. And well, it's Sarah, uh, Miss Washington is paying too. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Nunn. All those in favor? Five zero. Mr. 
Chair, move to accept another generous donation in the amount of $800 from the Young Women's League to be used to supplement educational enrichment at the Coolidge Middle School. There a second. donation in the amount of ten thousand dollars to be used to support the district's behavioral health efforts with students to be used at any time at the discretion of the superintendent. Is there a second? Second. Wow. Yeah, yeah I, I just to uh, so that you're aware um, both schools at the middle school level the eighth grade will be doing the challenge day this year. Um, so we've been writing grants to help fund that and certainly this donation is going to go a long way to Help support that as well. Yes. So, Parker didn't do the challenge day last year. Last year they did not. The high school, high school, right. uh, grade ten did. Grade 10. Um, this year both middle schools and the eighth grade will be doing it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, yeah. Can you yes. tell me what challenge day is? <coughs> I should know this, but I don't. No, it was brand new. That yeah. <laughs> um, there were four of us, right? Involved in challenge day. Uh, so challenge day is a, a day where. There is a lot of team building and reflection among eighth grade students. Um, and really it is understanding and respecting people's differences and, and sharing that out with each other. There's a, it's a very emotional day um, with students and staff. There's, there's also several staff involved as well, staff and adults. Um, four of us were involved in some of the Challenge Day events last year. It's, it's, it's a pretty emotional day, but we got very positive results from it, um, from both staff and students. Um, it's something, and there are follow-up activities that go along with it after we, after we did that. It's just sort of based on the premise as well that, um, you know, in terms of trying to reduce bullying or that sort of behavior, that's very difficult to bully somebody if you really know them mm -hmm. um, beyond the labels or beyond the perception. So it builds those bridges um, among all students. It's been a very successful program surrounding districts that have used it for years. Um, so both middle schools and the high school administration were meeting at the end of last year to talk about where's, where's the best place to do this. Um, and so they agreed that while it will be done during the eighth grade year for students, the high school will also connect and probably include some staff. And they're looking at ways to make to use it as a transition time to bring both middle schools at a time when they're going into the high school. Yeah, I happen to have an eighth grade, so I'm very excited about it. What um, what time do you? December. It's December. Yeah, December. I had to think for a second. December. December. Thank you very much. Yes. Okay. Um, I got to participate in Challenge Day last year, and I would um, I guess I would challenge the administration in the spirit of challenging um, to to look at if this is a direction we want to move at going forward. How do we measure school, school climate? How do we measure that this is a successful program? It's, it's a very expensive program. This donation is unbelievably generous, and it's for such an important cause, which is behavioral health of our students. Um, but I do think we have an obligation to make sure that we're using it in a way that we can measurably say is reducing bullying, is creating a safer and a more supportive school environment. So that's a, sort of a challenge I'll put out there. Next year, if we intend to move forward with this program as a district, I'm going to be asking, well, how do you know it worked? What, what data are you collecting? So um, I'll be interested to hear more about the impact I'd like to echo that, and, and um, you know, heard great things about it. Not, not by any means questioning the valid, of, you know, the, the success of it or, or its usefulness. But I do think it's important to um, come back with data. We, we all care about data, right? And student impact down the road, not necessarily programs like this. Um, from my experience, and, and not just my, you know, personal experience, but my professional experience, um, do have an impact. But it's also considered sometimes short term. And um, having been involved in conducting many of these you know, types of programs, I've uh, been involved with Rachel's Challenge, which is a similar type of program. <coughs> in high school, did it years ago, we did it in Danvers. Um, 
other programs, including um, uh, the uh, SAG. Um, um, I'm trying to blank. What was the one you talking to you about today? Um, the big stage car crash. Right. Yeah. Um, mock car crash. Um, you know, I've, I've seen them a lot of effort and time and money spent on it and efforts and resources. And um, sometimes I, I'm not so sure that had long-lasting impact in changing behavior and culture. So well, let's, we can just vote on accepting the donation. Okay. Right, right now. no question, sorry. Yes. I was just going to say that I would also caution not to go just solely in terms of numbers or data, that there are anecdotal things. There are, um, there's, there can be lots of evidence to document the effectiveness of a program like this, although it can be difficult. Over time, the idea that this will be something that happens every year and will potentially, in, in goal, trickle down and trickle up when the students go to the high school. So hopefully there will be ways to see changes in our culture. And I mean, we had evidence of um, connections, increased empathy and compassion that happened after this pilot study. So hopefully we will be able to document that. I should add not, not to repeat it, because I agree with the point you're making, but just to, one thing that makes it a little bit different than some of the other programs, which I agree, um, the, the participants aren't passive enough to do it, and it's a day of facilitation. So people all day long are interacting in various types of activities, which I think is a very different situation than watching a watching program. I, can, I actually just want to say, Jerry said, um, that I met people at the event that I will never see the same way again, and that's something that impacts me. Um, I can speak for me on a frequent basis, that the connections I made and the way I look at people changed after participating in that program. Thank you. All those in favor of accepting the $10,000 donation? Zero. Pretty much vote except him. Yes. I should say this at every meeting, but obviously the generosity of the Young Women's League, the Commonwealth Family, all of these organizations, and this incredibly generous uh, anonymous donation is really quite amazing how supported our, our schools are. Oh, minutes? Yes. I move to approve the open session minutes dated August 31st, 2015. Discussion on the minutes. All those in favor? Six zero. Uh, yes. Uh, we will. Uh, we will now move into executive session to protect, protect the uh, litigation position of the committee. Mr. Chair, I move to enter into the executive session to discuss strategy with respect to litigation and the approval of minutes, and to not return to open session this evening. Second. 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 Denying? Yes. 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 